Danny from the Pleasant Hills Public Library, and I'm so excited that you're here with me today for STEAM Stories. Now this is our last STEAM Stories video of the spring season. Coming in summer, we will start doing weekly videos all about animals, but more on that later. Today we are going to be talking all about sundials, and we're going to read the book Anno's Sundial. Do you know what a sundial is? Have you ever seen one before? So a sundial is a piece of equipment that can tell the time based on the sun's position in the sky. Pretty neat, huh? Before the invention of watches and clocks, people used sundials to tell the time. A simple sundial has a rod or a gnomon that points upward and it casts a shadow along a flat surface. Based on where that shadow is, you can tell what time it is. Isn't that neat? And now let's look at some pictures of real sundials from around the country and learn a little bit more about their history. As the Earth rotates around its axis, different parts of the Earth face the sun directly. The sun remains in the same place, but since we're moving, it appears that the sun is moving across the sky. As we rotate, though, the angle the sun hits the earth changes, and so the gnomon casts a shadow at a different spot on the clock. Sundials have been used for centuries and were very popular in Europe and Egypt to tell the time. In fact, the oldest sundial discovered was in 3500 BC, created by the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians. As the years passed, people became more and more reliant on the sundial to tell the time, and in the Middle Ages, sundials had their golden era and were found in almost every household or town. Some sundials are works of art, while others are very ancient and a little rusted. Here we're picturing various sundials you can find in the city of Pittsburgh. And now, friends, we are going to read our title story, Anno's Sundial, written and illustrated by Mitsumaso Anno, and read today with permission of Penguin Random House. Now, this is a pop-up book, so that you can best experience it. We're going to get real close. Are you ready? Before there were clocks and watches, people used the shadows of trees and stones to tell time. When cities were built, people used the shadows cast by a tower in the town square in the same way. In the morning when the sun rose in the eastern sky, long shadows fell to the west at noon. When the sun was high in the sky, the shadow was shortest. As the day went by, the sun moved towards the western horizon, and the lengthening shadows moved steadily towards the east. The tower in the town square acted as a big sundial. This is a map of the part of Earth you could see if you looked down at it from a spaceship right above the North Pole. If you could put a tower upright at the North Pole and then draw lines on the Earth to mark 24 equal sections radiating around it, you would have made an enormous and very accurate sundial. At the North Pole, the shadow of the tower moves 15 degrees every hour. For a few days in summer, the sun shines 24 hours a day at the North Pole. It does not rise and it does not set. On these days, the shadow sweeps through a full circle every 24 hours. Since this is the only time the shadow moves through the full 360 degrees, it's the perfect time to use your sundial. Suppose you started at noon, when the sun has reached its highest position for the day. When the shadow has moved 15 degrees, it will be 1 p.m. After 30 degrees, it will be 2 p.m., and so on. The position of the shadow tells you the time, and you don't need a clock at all. We say the tower shadow moves, but it really doesn't. It just seems to move because as Earth spins around in the light of the sun, different parts pass under the shadow. But actually, the shadow remains stationary. To understand this more clearly, think of Earth as a ball with a stick going through its center, from North Pole to South Pole. Earth spins around on this stick, which is called the axis of the Earth. It takes 24 hours for Earth to make one complete turn or rotation around its axis. You could think of the tower as an extension of Earth's axis. Here we have shown Earth on its axis as an orange with a stick through it. Earth spins around or rotates on its axis in the direction shown by the arrows. The six maps below the oranges are all the same small part of the big map, but shown in six different positions. The lines on the maps are called meridians of longitude. The red line on each is called the prime meridian, and it goes through Greenwich, England. The meridians are numbered beginning with the prime meridian, which is both 0 and 24, as it is the meridian that marks the beginning and the end of the 24-hour day. The line west of the prime meridian is 15 degrees away, and this is called the 15 west longitude meridian. The other meridians are named similarly in 15 degree intervals, 30, 40, 5, 60, and so on. 
Each map, as the illustration above shows, Earth turned 30 degrees, or two hours, past the map to its left. The orange shows how Earth also turns through the same time and distance. The prime meridian, the red line, moves eastward as Earth turns. In 24 hours, one full day, it'll turn through 360 degrees. Suppose we start measuring the time at noon at Greenwich. That's where the sun is directly above the prime meridian. Later on, if you know how far Earth has turned, you can tell the time because you know that 15 degrees equals one hour. So if Earth has turned 30 degrees, it's 2 p.m. It is solar noon, noon by the position of the sun, at a particular place on Earth when the sun reaches its highest position over that place for that day. As Earth turns, the noontime location shifts westward. For example, one after it is noontime in New York City, it's noontime in Chicago, which is about 15 degrees west of New York. Earth itself acts like a big sundial. When we know how far a shadow has moved, we know how much time has passed, and you can tell the hour. The sun does not always rise to the same height in the sky at noon at all times of the year. As Earth rotates on its axis, it also goes around the sun, and that is, it revolves. It takes a year for Earth to make one revolution around the sun. While going around the sun once, Earth rotates 365 times. Each rotation takes a day, so there are 365 days in a year. In the diagram above, you can see that Earth's axis is not perfectly straight up and down. It's tilted 23.5 degrees from the perpendicular. Because of this, in northern summer, the upper half of the Earth is tilted towards the sun. Then the sun appears higher in the sky. In winter, the northern half is tilted away from the sun, and then the sun is low in the sky. Days are shorter, and the weather grows colder. This picture shows Earth at the beginning of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. The picture on the opposite shows Earth at the start of winter in the Northern Hemisphere. During summer, there are more hours of daylight than during the winter. This is because the Earth's axis is tilted 23.5 degrees towards the sun. If the axis were upright, there would be no changes of season on Earth. The man stands at the same latitude, distance from the equator, in both pictures. During summer, on the left, the sun is nearly overhead. Notice the man's short shadow. During winter, on the right, the sun does not get nearly as high, and because of this, the man's shadow is much longer. The blue and red arrows show the boundaries of the areas north of the equator, where the sun is high overhead in summer, and those south of the equator, where the sun is high overhead in winter. In these areas, the sun is never directly overhead, and the change of season from summer to winter is quite noticeable. The area between the two sets of arrows is called the torrid zone. This is the region where the sun is high during all seasons and is directly overhead at some time during the year. In the torrid zone, it is warm all year long and seasonal changes are small. In order to make our own small sundials accurately, we need to understand how our big sundial, Earth, is measured and marked. We've been using the terms latitude and longitude, but what do these really mean? Let us use an orange again to represent Earth. If you cut it in half horizontally, as in the picture on the left above, the line you cut along is the equator. Now, cut some more slices across the orange parallel to the equator, and those lines are the parallels of latitude. We mark the latitude of the equator as zero degrees, and the other parallels of latitude are expressed by their degree of angle from the equator, drawn from the center of the Earth. The parallels of latitude are drawn north and south of the equator. In all places along the same degrees of latitude, the height of the sun at noon and the length of the period of daylight are the same. Now, let us slice the earth orange the other way, right down the middle lengthwise into vertical sections as in the picture of the right above. The lines between the sections are called the meridians of longitude. We have talked about these before. The vertical line or meridian of longitude that passes through the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England is marked at zero degrees. It is the prime meridian. The meridians of longitude east and west of this line are numbered by their degrees of angle from the prime meridian, drawn from the center of the Earth, usually every 15 degrees. Now, let us consider noon again. When you stand on the ground, as shown on the bottom of the facing page, the line that passes from north to south right over your head is your meridian. It is noon when the sun is on the meridian. If two places are located along the same longitude, no matter how far apart north to south, both have the same meridian, and it is noon at the same moment in both places. Places west of you have noon a bit later. New York City, at about longitude 75 degrees, is in the eastern time belt or zone. Chicago, in the central time, be time belt, at about longitude 90 degrees, has noon one hour later. In Denver, about longitude 105 degrees, which is in the mountain time belt, noon is two hours later.
and in Los Angeles, about longitude 120 degrees, in the Pacific time belt, noon is three hours later. Alaska and Hawaii, about longitude 150 degrees, are five hours later. Other countries or areas have their own standard time. You can find any place on the map if you know its latitude and longitude. On this world map, vertical lines are meridians of longitude and horizontal lines are parallels of latitude. The blue and red arrows mark the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, the boundaries of the sun's apparent north-south movement. Between the arrows is the torrid zone, that part of Earth where at some time during the year the sun is directly overhead. As its name implies, it is usually hot in the torrid zone. The temperature zones are colored lavender on this map, and notice how many cities there are in these areas. Above the Arctic Circle, 66.5 degrees north, and below the Antarctic Circle, 66.5 degrees south, the sun does not set during part of the year, and during the opposite season, it does not rise. These areas are often extremely cold. Make your own sundial. You could start with the simplest one of all, a stick in the ground, but you'll probably want to make a sundial that's more convenient than that perhaps like the one pictured here. This is called a top sundial. On a piece of thin cardboard, draw a circle and divide it into 24 equal sections of 15 degrees each. Use a protractor to measure the angles. Trace the shadow casting pole and tape it to your dial. You do not have to make the vertical poles you see on this model. In some places, these poles around one side of the dial help to make the shadow more clearly visible, but they aren't essential. Now imagine that your top sundial is placed upright at the North Pole. At noontime, when the sun is as high as it will get for the day and the shadow is shortest, the top should be turned so that the shadow falls on the 12 o'clock line. Now, as the shadow moves around the dial, we can read the time. 13 is 1 p.m., 14 is 2 p.m., and so on. Top-shaped sundial can also be used at locations other than the North Pole. All you need to do is place it on a north-south line and tilt it so that stick or axis points towards the Polaris, the North Star. That's the same as tilting it at an angle equal to your latitude. Thus, at latitude 36 degrees north, the axis of your sundial is tilted 36 degrees from the horizontal. The picture on the opposite page shows how the dial should be placed at various latitudes on Earth. Notice that the axis of the dial is always parallel to the axis of Earth, the heavy blue line. All the axes point to Polaris, the North Star. The top sundial can also be used in the southern hemisphere. This picture shows the hemisphere during its winter. Notice that the axis of the sundial is always parallel to Earth's axis, just as it was in the Northern Hemisphere. While the top sundial is useful, it can be difficult to read because in some seasons, the shadows fall on the underside of the dial. But if we adapt the top dial to another form, we can use it in many different places. You can adapt the top sundial to a horizontal or vertical sundial quite easily. On a horizontal sundial, the shadow falls onto a surface that is parallel with your own horizon. The picture on the left shows the flat surface, white, and the axis, blue, of the dial at various latitudes. By transferring the lines on your top sundial to a horizontal surface, you can make a horizontal sundial. If you transfer the lines to a vertical surface, you make a vertical sundial. The sundial on this page is made for use at latitude 35 degree north. Its axis is tilted at an angle of 35 degree north from the horizontal surface. The axis, or the shadow casting stick, of a sundial is called the gnomon. In the northern hemisphere, the half of Earth that lies north of the equator, when this dial is placed with the S towards the south, it can be used any place where the latitude is 35 degrees north. In the southern hemisphere, that dial is placed so the S is pointing north. Then it can be used anywhere at latitude 35 degrees south. You can make sundials for any latitude you want. They're all the same, except that the angle of the gnomon with the base varies with the latitude. Here are several examples so you can see how they vary. Sundials give us solar time, which is not the same as clock time. In solar time, a change of one degree in the sun's position is equal to four minutes, and 15 degrees is an hour. So places that are only one degree apart have a difference of four minutes in solar time. This can lead to problems in scheduling or making any plans that depend on agreeing to meet at a certain time. To solve such problems, world standard time was invented. Your sundials will be more accurate if you are located in the middle of a time zone, for example, on the 75 degree, 90 degree, 105 degree, or 120 degree meridian. If you are east of the middle, you must subtract four minutes for each degree. And if you are west of the middle, add four minutes for each degree. Thus, if you are five degrees east of the meridian, you must subtract 20 minutes from the dial reading. In 1884, representatives from many countries met in Washington, D.C. to discuss ways of settling the confusion about telling time. They agreed that time should be measured starting from the prime meridian, the one that passes through Greenwich, England. 
When the sun is on that meridian, the clock is set at 12 noon, Greenwich Mean Time, or World Standard Time. Places within 7.5 degrees on either side of the prime meridian would also have noon as their time. Places 15 degrees west of Greenwich would be at 11 a.m., and 15 degrees east of Greenwich it would be 1 p.m., and so on. In this way, the world was divided into 24 standard time zones. Travelers would change their watches by a whole hour only after going through 15 degrees of longitude rather than every four minutes as they had to do when using solar time. Some adjustments had to be made in the boundaries of these time zones as oceans, mountains, and the irregular borders of many countries made it impossible to divide the time zones into perfectly equal sections of the globe. But still, it's quite easy now to know what time it is in any country in the world. To celebrate the 100th anniversary of World Standard Time, the United Kingdom issued several stamps in 1984. The red line shows the prime meridian from the left, passing through the telescope that measures the sun's position, passing through the Royal Greenwich Observatory, passing through England, and passing around the Earth. An hourglass can be thought of as bottle time. The passing of time is measured by the falling sand, which takes three minutes in an egg timer, for example. Watches and clocks also measure the passage of time, but all such devices keep time based on Earth's rotation, the time needed to make one complete turn. Earth is an ever-moving sundial. And now, friends, it's time for STEAM! So our STEAM kits are available while supplies last in our lobby, and they have all the supplies you need to make your very own simple sundial. Inside your steam kit is a paper plate that already has a hole punched in it, a straw, a bag of air dry clay, and a compass. But we don't need the compass just yet, so let's focus on these things. Your plate already has a hole punched in it, but it is a very small hole, so you might need scissors to make it a little bigger. That's what I did here. Then you're going to take your bendy straw, open it up, put the bendy side down in through the hole, all the way, flip your plate over, Bend the straw down and take a little bit of the clay. You should have more than enough in your bag, so feel free to make something else with it. Take your clay and push it down over top of the hole and the straw. Eventually, that'll harden and keep your straw in place, but for right now, we want it to be a little flexible, so that's great. And then your sundial is done, at least for now. Now you have to take it outside on a nice sunny day and tell the time. So let's learn how to do that. Once you've finished building your sundial, it's time to set it. So you're gonna need a beautiful sunny day where they're not forecasting any rain, which admittedly in Pittsburgh is kind of rare, but today is a good day. We are going to start at noon because that's the easiest time to set your sundial because you know that the sun is directly overhead. Set your sundial somewhere where shadows are not going to be cast on it throughout the day. This location is maybe not the best location, but it was easier for me to film it here than the middle of my yard, so let's go with it. <laughs> Next, you'll need your compass. You have one in your steam kit, and you're going to use it to locate north. Now, true north and magnetic north are not exactly the same thing, so there will be a little bit of variance in our time telling, but our sundials are still going to be fairly accurate. Once you have north on your compass, you're going to point your straw ever so slightly in that direction so it casts a bit of a shadow. Then take a pencil or marker and when it's noon, make a line and write the number 12. Now if possible, leave your sundial in that exact same location and come back in the next hour on the hour and do the same thing. Mark the line and write the number. Keep doing that for as long as you're able when the sun is up. And if you're able to, leave your sundial out overnight and do the morning hours as well. And if it's extra nice, leave it out for a whole nother day and see if your lines are still accurate. Pretty neat, huh? The weather here in Pittsburgh is not always exactly very sunny, which works best for sundials. So you might have to wait a little bit to get an accurate reading. But once you do, we would love to hear from you. We would love to see pictures of your sundial and hear about your experience learning to tell time using the sun. Feel free to send us pictures or videos to pleasanthills at einetwork.net or post to our special Facebook group, Pleasant Hills Library Virtual Programming. At the beginning of this video, I teased a little bit of information
information about our summer reading program. And now I would like to tell you a little bit more. Our theme for summer reading this year is Tales and Tales. So as you might have guessed, we're going to do a lot of learning about animals. One fun program that I'd like to tell you about is our STEAM Creatures, where every week starting June 9th through August 11th, we'll feature a different video about animals and a take-home kit that you can pick up the Monday prior. Pretty exciting, huh? Also, we will be running a virtual summer reading club using Beanstack. You can sign up on the library's webpage or you can download the Beanstack app. It looks like this. In all of the programs, you will earn raffle tickets for logging books that you have read. And you can earn more raffle tickets for completing fun activities. Those raffle tickets you can put towards any of our awesome weekly raffles. We're raffling off Target gift cards, Amazon gift cards, Pleasant Hills Vocelli gift certificates, and themed raffle baskets. We have a program for children that aren't quite reading independently yet, children that are reading independently, teens and adults. So there's something for everyone. So sign up today. It officially starts June 1st, but pre-registration is already open. Oh boy. Well, my friends, thanks for joining me and I hope you've enjoyed this STEAM Stories. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to give us a call at 412-655-2424 or send us an email at pleasanthills at AINetwork.net. I hope you have a great day and that I see you soon. Bye!